my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about healing our intimacy disorders, unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first ourselves and then others. Every episode, we will talk about advice you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow in your self-worth. I'm Sheena Lachey, Love Addiction Coach and Trauma Specialist. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. I'm so excited to have you with me today. Today, y'all, we are going to be talking about what to do when you like someone as a love addict. So the framing for this is if you have struggled with love addiction, you have been working on your love addiction patterns, you have been in recovery, you are closer to or you're feeling you're having more symptoms of being securely attached and you are entering new romantic relationships for the first time with this new clarity, with this new sense of self and just ready to do things differently this time around. And so I'm going to talk about three things for you to keep in mind to do to feel balanced as a recovering love addict in a new relationship. Uh, These are also going to be things that if you're already partnered with someone, it's going to help you kind of make sure that you're balanced there as well. But this is going to be really just good proactive things for you to, to do. I want to also say, just to be clear, that these are going to be things that are important for you to do. If you are partnered with someone who is healthy and someone who is available, securely attached, or maybe they're in recovery for love addiction, love avoidance, but they're actually doing the work and they are working on their attachment styles and they're working on their communication styles, that they are self-accountable, not that you are trying to convince them, not that you are looking up all of this couple stuff and that you're kind of having to drag them along with them, with you. Because then that's when we kind of get into some codependent stuff. Uh, many of you will will talk about and have talked about how you can be partnered with someone who you have real genuine attraction to. You're really excited to get to know them. And you see yourself kind of slipping into these love addictive symptoms, which are being very, very over attached to the outcome over attached to fantasy and the thoughts of them, ruminating about them, being highly sensitive to any threats of abandonment and rejection, even when they're not real. So text not coming through as quickly as you want them to. Again, I'm talking about people who are healthy and available. And so it's just us as love addicts wanting to hear and be in contact with them all the time. And when it's not all the time or when the tempo changes a little bit, we perceive that something's off versus the fact that we're most likely attracted to this person because they have a rich, full life. And so they're living that rich, full life that we really like about them in the first place. And another symptom of love addiction is when you might start off feeling very centered and connected to your core self. And then over time, you start to see that you have merged in your identity, uh, whether or not it's physically showing up or it's just in your head, uh, even emotionally with this being your other half even if there's not really any real commitment yet. And even if there is commitment, even if you are a long-term dating partner, uh, even if you are engaged, you have lost your sense of identity and it's merged into the fact that you are the other part of this coupleship and you are needing to regain yourself. These are going to be some things to help you stay balanced. Okay. So if you're ready, say ready. <laughs> uh, we're going to pretend that we are in the same space. So say ready if you're ready. And let's go ahead and jump in. So the first thing that I want you to keep in mind and to do whenever you are starting to like someone as a love addict. And for the rest of this, I'm going to be speaking mostly as if this is a new partnership or relationship versus y'all are well established is you need to stay in touch with your body and consistently be doing body work. So the reason I say that is because something that fuels love addiction 
a one core important fact for you to know about love addiction and love avoidance is that love addiction is basically a fight or flight response. So because of earlier trauma, we have learned to either overattach or underattach to people as a form of protection, as a form of resilience, as a form of getting our needs met and staying connected to people. So love addiction is a fight response where we can overattach to a person or the idea of who we want a person to be or a relationship because it has become our way out, either of emotional distress, of feeling low self-worth, of having a lifetime of feeling unwanted, whatever our core negative belief or trauma is, we will really fight to engage with, engage in and protect and cultivate this relationship to a, a place where it becomes a little bit obsessive because we don't really know how to give all those things to ourselves. So when you're just meeting somebody and you really like them, and, and I want everyone to normalize that it is okay to have a crush and have feelings for someone who you just are getting to know. A lot of the students who I work with, when it comes to them starting to date, they, they want to get to a place where they don't care at all and it's completely neutral. And I'm like, girl, girl, you better let yourself feel those butterflies. Let, let your feet kick up a little bit when you get a text come through, you know, like giggle. <laughs> don't, don't keep a straight face. Like be soft, lean into it, feel that tenderness, feel that care because that, those are the sweet parts. Those are, those are what makes it so good, you know? So don't rob yourself of that experience. And you're feeling all those things and a, a shift happens where you want it more and it shifts from just being you want it more because it feels good but you want it more because you're starting to frame a lot of your emotional safety from these dopamine hits from every moment that you know he she or they send you a text bring you flowers give you a compliment it starts to shift from you are able to have your own moments of joy, happiness, and, and dopamine <laughs> injection to where it starts to have a dependence on on that. So one way that I've seen this happen is, or see a good example of not knowing how to just be present in your body and not needing this constant stimulation from them. The stimulation being the influx of, I love you, you're wonderful, you're great, is what happens in the quiet moment with your partner or partners. A lot of times with love addicts, because we don't know how to just exist with someone without it, we are creating a fairy tale and we're off in this perpetual honeymoon and roller coaster of emotions. Whenever things are quiet, whenever things are peaceful, whenever you're just sitting around, that can be overstimulating and scary. It, there can be a thought that, oh, this is, are they bored? Am I boring? We should be doing something like we should be connecting. A lot of times people will rush to have sex in those moments and in a, in a bid to attach to them and have that intensity and have that passion uh, because you don't know what it's like to just relax and be in someone's presence and allow them to relax and be in your presence without you going to that negative core belief that you may not have hit on and cleared out yet that you are boring or you're not enough or you're not engaging enough or whatever. So you're looking for some kind of thing to keep it going. Non-sexual things are things like you want to talk about who you are as a couple. You're wanting to talk about future plans. You're wanting to talk about feelings for each other because you don't know how to have conversations about other things. You don't know how to just talk about what's going on in your life and going on in their life. And again, just being in each other's presence, relaxing. For those who have worked with me, y'all have seen me uh, talk about this a little bit more in depth when I talk about the riding the waves. So for y'all, the context is you have a really hard time being in the middle instead of being stuck on and stuck off. And so when that happens and you're like, I need something, we need something, or this is going to, they're going to get bored or they're going to change their mind or this is not as fun and all that. You got to breathe. You have to breathe. You need to come back into your body, get present, get grounded, remind yourself that you're enough, remind yourself that this moment is enough, remind yourself that all you have is this this second, this minute, this this moment together and you don't need to be in your head and go to okay, is this my my future partner, is this the next uh 
parent of my children? Is this, where is this going to go? How about we just focus on today? How about we just focus it on Tuesday and it's 11.59 a.m. Let's just focus on this moment and breathe and relax and affirm yourself, okay? You are your most important relationship and how you feel about you and how present you feel with you is going to dictate how happy you are in other places, okay? If you are constantly looking for the next best thing, in a relationship, even with this, even when it's with an amazing person, they are never going to be able to to catch up and to stay on track with this ever increasing need that you're going to have for more. I need more. I need more love. I need more compliments. I need more stimulation. I need more dates. I need more flowers. I need more, 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 more. Because remember, intimacy disorders, love addiction, love avoidance is never about the person that you're connected to. It's about your trauma playing out and you trying to find a resolution to it, okay? So um, these, of course, are easier things to do. Like, even if this is making sense to you, this is so much easier when you are in recovery. Well, it's still going to be a a learning curve because you're going to be breaking habits. But uh, don't try to skip the process of doing the internal work. Love addiction, love avoidance are not mental... They're not based in our brain, which is why whenever we try to stop things and we try to make promises and say, I'm going to do better, when the next situation or opportunity comes up for you to do something different, you do what you've always done before, because it's not about willpower. It's not about a personal promise. It's not about whether or not you actually want it to change. You can want things to change with your whole might, but your your body, your mind, your energy is hardwired. Well, it's not hardwired. It's soft wired <laughs> because we can unlearn it. It's soft wired to reflexively act in certain ways. So please do not skip out on the recovery work that you need to do. Okay. So that's the first thing. And before I go to the next one, I want to say, this is why I, this is why unrecovered love addicts typically attach to two different types of people. They typically attach to people who are avoidant, so maybe not abusive, but people who just are emotionally unavailable. So they can be physically present, but emotionally absent. They can be cheaters. They can be um, people who tell half-truths. They can be people who live um, on the opposite side of the world or have, have, um, have jobs that make them unavailable. I want to say very, very clearly before I go for it, because I, I know that probably hit somebody and like, what? What do you mean? My The love of my life is on the other side of the world. Uh, that's wonderful. I'm not talking about the special instances. I'm talking about those of us who consistently, no matter what, we find people who are always in some way unavailable for us. And so I think I've talked about in earlier episodes how I would always find people who worked tons of hours. Like it'd be a mixture between someone who was emotionally un- unavailable and if I worked someone who, if I met someone who seemed like they were emotionally available. They were never available to have those conversations because they were busy. They were traveling. They would do something else. Right. So and I know there are many of us who always who have literally told me you always fall in love with people who are across the world, who are in different states that are never nearby you. And that is something for you to look out for. But anyways, love addicts can typically fall for people who are unavailable in some way and or people who are narcissists. And the reason why narcissists are so attractive, especially at the beginning, is because they will do all of this intense, constant world building with you, where they will keep going and going. The love bombing is hot as hell. The love bombing is like everything you wanted, ooey gooey, you know, I've never met someone like you. I, I think about you all the time. You know, they send you texts when you're not even thinking about them sending you texts. They got gifts. They have experiences. They talk about plans y'all are going to make. They're taking you on trips. Like, a, a nar- no, one, no one woos like a narcissist at the beginning. And that shit is a setup. <laughs> it's a setup, y'all. <laughs> and if you're not clear on the importance of staying present and being in your body and pay, and paying attention to making sure that every moment actually feels genuine and good, you will fall for the quick gratification and the quick payoff of the narcissist because you don't know 
you don't know what slow and steady you don't know that slow and steady can be just as engaging and fun and 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 sexy and beautiful as an instant startup where you are in Tahiti the next weekend after you just met somebody. Um, so yeah, that's the first thing. The second thing is, well, actually, let me do what I wrote down for the third one, since I just talked about narcissists and love bombing. The second thing for a love addict to do is to practice self-affirmation even more so. Okay, so if you've already been in recovery, you've been healing and now you call yourself a recovering love addict or now again, you uh, you you claim that you are securely attached and claim in a genuine way, not, you know, so they say kind of way, but you actually are having more symptoms of secure attachment. You usually I mean, you get there by challenging your self-talk, challenging the negative and nasty things you say to yourself and learning how to see yourself in a more positive life and starting to feel more full, okay? So that is all great. And it brings you to a place where you're open to love in all forms, not just romantic relationships, but love from other people, from friends, from new opportunities, uh, just feeling okay, just being in quiet moments with yourself, going out on solo dates and having just as much fun as you would. Otherwise, it, it just it, it opens your life up to a rich experience. And when you are connected to, when you're starting to be connected romantically to someone who really digs you and really likes you, those compliments feel so good because they're supposed to feel good. Again, do not try to protect yourself from becoming, from falling into patterns of love addiction by completely rejecting attempts from other people to pour into you. If someone's giving you a compliment, Don't say, oh, well, let me not care that much and just downplay it. Girl, if you don't say thank you and and blush and, you know, I'm a giggler, so I'm going to keep saying giggle Um, and giggle (laughs) and get all cute and stuff. Let yourself feel good. Let yourself feel sparkly and all that stuff on the inside. Receive that because that's for you. That's a gift. Uh, uh, Live in it. Love it. So. So those those compliments and uh, the attention and the gifts and the texts and all that stuff feel the dates, you know, especially if there's someone who happens to be very thoughtful and they're very intentional about planning things. Um, all that stuff feels good. But if you're not mindful of you making sure that you are self-affirming and that you don't get lax in affirming yourself and you don't get lax in esteeming yourself, what will happen is this person's this person's attention to you will start to replace what you've already been giving to yourself, which is how love addiction also gets fueled. Love addiction being that we use a person, a relationship, or the fantasy of a relationship to self-soothe, to comfort, and to and to fill some holes inside of us that we don't know how to fill ourselves. But in this instance, you know how to feel it, but it's kind of easier to to lean into this person. And especially if this person is consistently available, I mean you do start to build some trust there, this trust that they are going to be consistent, that they are going to um, be reliable. So it kind of is easier to to let go of that need to do this emotional work all the time. So here's the shift that happens though when you do that. You can go from appreciating compliments to then, now I'm expecting that you're going to give me a compliment. Then when they, Then that shifts to being picky about the compliments so the types of compliments that they get, that, that they give now, you wanted it to be worded a certain way. You wanted it to come at a certain time. It was missing a certain quality. And so the compliment isn't as good anymore. And you start to pick it apart and you start to get a little bit angry and resentful about it, right? Because they weren't hitting it the right way, which y'all, by the way, it's not their responsibility to do that. It's your responsibility to fill yourself. But the last thing that it will shift into is now... You've been picking it apart. It's not good enough. Now you're demanding compliments. You didn't call me pretty today. You didn't, you didn't, you don't want to spend time with me. If you did, you would say this. You would do this if you actually wanted to do this. When meanwhile, this person is most likely, again, if they're healthy and available and staying consistent, they're doing the exact things they were always doing in the relationship. So what shifted? What happened? They didn't change. Your emotional dependence on this is what changed. Yes? So if that's the case, what you have to do is what you have to is you have to learn how to find that balance uh, in which oh 
y'all. Let me finish my thought. Y'all need to find the balance in between being open and receptive to this, but also knowing and, and practicing that you got you, that you are um, the one who can love you better than anybody else can, and that it actually feels rich and full and tangible in how you love yourself, okay? What I was going to say is just a throwback to our Healed and Love Woman framework, which I did not do a summer check-in. For those of y'all who are OGs, you know that since I started talking about our framework, my my goal is to do it twice a year at the beginning of the year and in the summer, and it is now August. So next week's episode, I'm going to be talking about when you like someone as a love avoidant. So we'll see if I do the final episode on the check-in for the Healed and Love Woman Framework, even though it's about two months later than I would want to. Uh, And we'll just revisit it again at the top of the year next year. Maybe we'll do it in February instead of January. Yes. But to be a Healed and Love Woman means that you are love balanced. Love balanced being the opposite of love addicted. So able to do all the things that I've already said. Okay, so... Uh, so what does this look like practically? Uh, whatever your partner says to use extra. So if you're not feeling cute today, instead of you kind of wishing that your partner would compliment you or even asking them, y'all know I am, I'm a big proponent for our partners are not mind readers. So to ask for what you want, but before you do that, can you go into the mirror and hype yourself up? Can you hype yourself up, tell yourself whatever language appeals to you, whether you're the type that says you a bad bitch in the mirror or whether or not you're saying, girl, you're glowing and you're lovely or whether you do a mixture of both. Can you go and truly look at yourself and gaze upon yourself and give yourself that type of love? If you are feeling neglected and you're looking around your home or your house or your apartment and you're wanting gifts and flowers and stuff, can you go and buy yourself some flowers and make sure that it's in a pretty vase and take pictures and stunt on the gram about the flowers you got in your house and brag on that instead of saying, man, I wish I had something to, to, to humble brag about. You can humble brag on how you love you and how you romance you. And this is so good, not only because it fills your tank, it alleviates the pressure of your partner because with in love addiction, nothing that we are asking of people is too much. Wanting compliments is not too much. Needing attention, wanting gifts, wanting thoughtfulness, none of those things are too much. But one is in that escalating scale that I said before where there's never there's never enough that this person can give you to, to satisfy or to satiate you because it's based in the trauma, tra- trauma need and not really on um, a neutral request, that is intense and heavy for another person. And I think a lot of us as love addicts can feel a lot of shame thinking that we are too clingy or too needy or we're too much, and we're not. We're absolutely not. You're going to still want and need and crave the same things that you did before, but you're going to bring in the fact that you can give it to yourself. Also, that this romantic partner is just one person in a giant world of relationships that you have. You have friendships, you have family, you have other people that you can be pouring into and not have everything focused on just this one person. And if this one person doesn't give me a compliment, if I'm not spending quality time with him, her or them, then I am empty. When you could be having these soulmate, deep, enriching connections and fun with so many other people, but you're restricting yourself to just this one person. Okay. And same thing, just use that same example in alignment with anything else that may be triggering you as, um, or not triggering, but any other related examples of ways that you may have been uh, putting your life and putting your needs on hold and funneling it all through this one person, this one experience, which is just unfair for them. So um, taking care of you is good for you, is good for alleviating that that stress on their part. And also it teaches people how to treat you. If someone comes in and they really like you, they are studying what what turns you on, what makes you happy, what brings you joy. You know, they they are learning you. And so they're going to watch what you do for yourself and what you don't do for yourself so that maybe they can start to anticipate your needs so that maybe they can be thoughtful and just, you know, when a gift season comes around or if there's someone who their love language is gifts and so gifts are all year round, that they can participate in, in, 
accentuating your life. And if you're self-neglecting and if you're just hanging out and if you're at home not doing hobbies and not spending time and not living your best life because you have in your head, one day I'll meet someone or one day I'll have this experience where I, I now I have permission to live, there's no, there's no place for them to fit, their, fit themselves into. There's no, no area of your life to highlight because it's dormant, which leads to the third one. When you like someone as a love addict, you need to keep your life going. You got to keep your life going. So even though I know love is no respecter of persons, people from all walks of life, all statuses, whether or not you have just gone through a super traumatic experience and you are feeling so, so broken and you just happen to meet someone who is the love of your life. To people who have done deep, enriching soul work and are feeling super healthy, and now they have built this super robust, full life. And like people say, when you're not expecting it, it comes for you. And then you meet someone just in you doing your daily um, experiences, right? I know all that happens. But because I'm talking to (laughs) y'all about love addiction and some preventative things for you to do, I just really want to emphasize that it is so important that the things, if you're someone who has worked to become healthy, that you keep doing the things that have made you healthy, which is having friendships, having hobbies, having things that keep you sane, having your own space, having downtime. And these things are so hard because when you like somebody, you want to spend all your time with them. You want to stay up past your bedtime and be on the phone. You want, you want to break all your boundaries and your rules. And even though that's, that's understandable and good, based on everything I've already said, then I'm not going to repeat that much. <laughs> but everything I've said about how important it is to maintain your own identity so that they have something to, to admire and to attach to, they... They are attracted to you because of who you are. And if you start to lose who you are, you think, you might think, oh, it's because I'm making space to be an asset and to be more available to them and for us to have more fun together. And no, 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 no. They liked what they saw of you. So you got to keep that same energy up. You got to keep that same energy up because it keeps you sane. It keeps you healthy. It keeps you interesting. And also it keeps a healthy sense of The word that's coming to me is self-preservation, but I hesitate to use it because it kind of has that defensive quality, like that that overprotection. I'm I'm afraid that you're going to hurt me energy that, you know, is not what we're going for. But it has this place where you can be fully you still so that you can connect to another person who's fully them and have a really full experience together. Hopefully that made sense. So, um, you know, sometimes people will hear that. Um, from from maybe me or some other advisor or, you know, a sermon or a counselor or something. And they will do it in theory. They will do kind of, the, they'll go through the motions of having a life, but really they're just doing their hobbies until the other person calls them or until they plan a date on the date they always have their line dance class (laughs) and then they skip the line dance class just for that night. It's just for that night because this is a special occasion, but no, it's not just for that night. You're starting a pattern of starting to abandon yourself. And so you have to start having some really sacred time around you and what pours into you. And if, if there is a situation where, you know, work schedules change, this is a real serious committed relationship And so it makes sense for you to maybe adjust the night of one of your classes or something, you know, if you're married or engaged or doing something. But even then, y'all, even then, (laughs) y'all, I still feel like, you know, people always talk about how important it is for people to miss you. It's so important for people to have that space so that when y'all come back together, it's, it's fun, it's lively, that it's not smothering, that you have stories to share about what they did while y'all weren't together and what you did when you weren't together and that you're able to grow and just continue to find each other interesting. I just, I think it's okay to have those boundaries and I think it's important to have those boundaries. Um, one really subtle way that love addiction and fantasy can also get in the way of you maintaining your own life, it's in your thought patterns. So that's a question I get a lot from from people when it comes to 
how do you work through fantasy? And I've said this before, but this is the only thing out of anything I will ever teach that I will, that I will ever, ever say, just stop it. And fantasy is one of those things. <laughs> when it comes to fantasy, fantasy, we, we nurture, nurture our fantasies. We will block out, maybe, maybe not we, I'll speak for myself. When I am in a fantasizing mode, I am turning off my phone. I'm going to spend the whole morning, the whole night, whatever, just really get into visualizing what scenario or scenarios I'm wanting to happen. And so fantasy isn't something that just falls into your head. Fantasy is something that we cultivate and, and we pour into. So uh, the phrase that I tell my students a lot the, the, that I really love is you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. So you may have a fleeting thought where it's like, well, what are they doing? And are they thinking about me and all this stuff? Well, it shot the birds in the air. But if you take that thought and then you spend whatever period of time, um, usually neglecting other things you're supposed to be doing. Um, for me, I have to watch my morning routine because it's very easy to neglect meditating or journaling or something else for just fantasizing about the previous date or whatever and just replaying these moments over and over again and what will happen then or what are they thinking about me instead of actually living my life and pouring into myself. And so I really want y'all to be mindful about your fantasy, redirect your thoughts, just stop it (laughs) and replace it with thoughts that are nourishing to you, that are growth oriented to you that are about your life and not about building this life with this other person. Now, of course, there's going to be space and time. I mean, you you may be hearing this and thinking, well, maybe you're not. I don't think you are. Because I think the thought that I was thinking that y'all might be thinking (laughs) is like, well, when do we talk about our feelings and talk about our emotions? And you do all that stuff when you're together. But going back to the first point, I was talking about not having to fill the space with every single minute. It's about how much you care about each other and how much you love each other and how much you're thinking about each other. But to actually know how to get to know each other as people, as souls, as human beings, as full entities outside of each other. Um, Because that friendship, that connection, that humanness is what's going to make it work, is what's going to make it last. If you are with someone who is not available, with someone who has maybe a mental illness that might be like a mood disorder, an untreated mood disorder, because I know there's a a good number of us listening to this podcast who have mood disorders, but we are, we have a therapist, we have medication, we are our natural remedies, we are actively working on it. But for someone who is untreated or not in recovery for whatever they are working with or dealing with, uh, especially if it's something like borderline personality disorder, which has uh, such a heavy heavy threat response for those who 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 deal with it um highly sensitive towards abandonment and rejection anything like that you having the type of space that i'm talking about right now and having some differentiation uh and some healthy normal amount of detachment is going to be very triggering to that person so it's going to be up to you to recognize is this whatever request a person is giving me, is this coming from a place where they are um, needing me to show up more than what I actually am able to give? Or is this a reasonable request? And uh, I'll say this. Any, any, any persons who are listening to this who have something like borderline personality disorder and uh, are now in recovery for it, they can probably co-sign what I'm about to say, which is, In hindsight, that no amount of attention, love, availability, time, effort that you will give them will prevent them from feeling as if you are not, um, you are giving enough. Because the core of that pain, the core of what they're dealing with starts from within. It started before you got here and it's going to keep going until they are able to find the recovery and the peace and the balance that they need. And so don't, don't. And your empathy and your kindness and your compassion do not get lost in uh, trying to save somebody and um, adjusting this healthy balance that we're talking about today uh, to try to be to to stop them from feeling as if they're doing something wrong because they're not doing something wrong. But their feelings that they are uh, 
again, didn't start with you and it's not going to be fixed by you. So that's one sign of availability. If someone is just avoidant, uh, then if you do any of these things, they may completely just fall off because avoidance are typically banking on you to do the weight and the labor and the initiating and the attention and all that stuff. And so when you are owning your part of it and being responsive to what they give, when they're not giving anything, then the relationship is going to dissipate. The other alternative is that they may see it as a game. <laughs> uh, they may not, they may think, oh, she's trying to show that she's not available. So, okay. And so they may come back and forth, but same thing. You got to stay true. And also you'll be able to pay attention to that fact. Well, um, if they're inconsistent, you get to choose who your partner with y'all. Just because someone likes you, just because y'all had initial great connection, just because things seem nice at the beginning does not mean you have to keep dating them. When you're dating someone, if you're dating for towards long-term commitment, if that's something that you want, whether or not it's marriage or if you don't believe in marriage, but just being in a monogamous partnered relationship with someone or even polyamorous, you know, polyamorous, polyamorous couples, but, but still long-term commitment. This is a valuation period. No one is entitled to your time, to your energy. So if you see a red flag, honor the red flag. Or if you see that there's a disconnection, maybe it's not a red flag, but they're not able to show up the way that you want them to, or you're not able to show up the way that they want you to. This doesn't mean y'all have to adjust to be in each other's spaces. It means that maybe y'all need to find someone who can show up the way that you want them to. And the last person, if, if the person's a narcissist and you're doing these things, they are going to do... They're going to uptick the love, bo- love bombing. They're going to really try to guilt and shame you that you're not giving enough. I remember, and I share this with my students. Um, <laughs> I remember this one time I was talking to this one guy who was a narcissist. And this was the red flag that told me they were a narcissist. Um, they said we were having a conversation and we were still just kind of getting to know each other. And he was like, Sheena, I feel like you're not really you know, open with how you feel about me. And in my head, I'm like, I said a more colorful word, but I said, I don't even know you. And this is in my head. And so I was like, that's something a narcissist would say. And someone who's trying to force this very quick connection and commitment with a stranger. No, 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 no. So um, watch out for that. Um, So that is today's episode. Like I said, next week, I'm going to be talking about what to do uh, when you're a love, love avoidant who likes someone. All of these lessons, all of these lessons, like I said, are make sense logically, but implementing them, following through with them are so hard. And especially if you haven't been doing the core work that goes underneath this stuff, it's even harder because to, to just be, repeat what I said earlier, this is reflexive. This is, you're not, it's not, it's subconscious. You're not consciously creating these decisions and making these turns. They just, they happen. And even when I first started my love addiction recovery, even though I was a licensed therapist, trained in couples therapy, helping people heal from trauma with my own healthy group of friends and and a great therapist, I was still acting up in my love addiction and I needed something else. I needed some extra support to help get recovered. And so that is why I created the recovery school so that other love addicts would not keep (laughs) going through the same twists and turns that I did, even when I was, quote unquote, doing all the right things. And even when I I had the knowledge, supposedly, that I was supposed to have to walk through it, it's different when you're in it. And having that outside eye, having the words and the language that helps put to help clarify what are the things you've been doing, it releases you. That's something I've heard repeatedly since I first started teaching all these years ago, is that the first the first gift of freedom that people have received from listening to this podcast or paying attention to any of my materials is having language for what was going on. So that they did not just think, oh, I'm just doing this just because, or there's a problem with me, or maybe I'll grow out of it, or why do I keep doing these things that are wrong? No, there there are actual terms and you're not crazy and you're not wrong and you're not broken. These are all learned and they can be unlearned and you can find this balance. You can find that the ability to be available. You can find the ability to actually walk in your love worthiness at all times. So our recovery school coaching program, my recovery school coaching program is the way that I help women do that about my students have probably heard 
about half of what I taught today. And then, of course, a lot more and just really going into depth about trauma and how this shows up and all the things that go along with it. So I would love to support you in that. This is my last and final cohort while I teach this live um, that I'm going to be hosting. It's going to be for this September. So I'm having an open house on Tuesday, August 30th at 6.30 p.m. CST, where I will be going over my coaching program, what I teach, how I support people, the structure, what it entails, uh, the cost, the payment plans, and all the things that go along with it. And so the open house is free to attend, of course, and you will have an invite to join me in the September cohort, and it will be going through the end of this year, and then I will no longer be te teaching it live. So to save your seat, you can go to blackgirlsheal.org slash open house and sign up, and you will get all the reminder emails and links to attend and join us on that evening. So that is it for now. If Even if you can't attend, still sign up. Um, I may send a replay. It'll only be available for a day or so because I know people have jobs. I know things come up. And in the past, I've, I've had people, uh, you've had to just show up to the next open house the next time I've had it. But because this is the last one, uh, like the real last one, <laughs> uh, I think I'm going to send a replay for uh, that's going to be available for a day or so for, for you to watch later. But I do think you should come live because you'll be able to ask me any questions that you may have uh, while I'm teaching it. So that is it. Again, blackgirlsheal.org slash open house. And yeah, I hope y'all have a wonderful week. And I hope that you're taking care of yourselves. And I hope that if anybody is caking and falling in love, that you are doing it with your full heart and letting them love you because you deserve to feel all the good things. All right. That's it, y'all. I will see you next time. Take care of yourselves.